Howdy! In this video, we'll use the simulator to demonstrate the serial adder with control circuitry. No slides here, but we will often hop back to this image, which outlines the general data path and control model in use, as well as the specific next state table for this design. First, let's make sure the circuit works. Over on the right side is my monitoring station, which can be used to track progress. Here we see that the counter keeps on counting, but that isn't accomplishing anything currently. The state display shows that the circuit is in the idle state zero. Now I will simply choose two values that I want to add. Let's say two and three. I enter those on the hex keypads. Then I activate the start signal. Notice that the state has been updated to one or load, which means the process has started. Now I flip the start switch low and wait for all the gears to turn. Eventually the load state is complete and the circuit moves to add state 2. Four clock ticks later the state returns to idle and we see the sum stored in this output register. Good news! 2 plus 3 does equal 5. Now let's try to identify the various components of the data path and control model. First, the data path is where the input data gets processed into output data. The input data is two 4-bit numbers named A and B and entered manually here through hex keyboards. The output data is a 5-bit sum here stored in this register. This 8-bit register is larger than we actually need thus D5 through 7 tied straight to ground, but there was no 5-bit register available in the simulator. The data path itself is this serial adder device symbol. Inside of this device is the circuit with the full adder and 4-bit shift registers discussed in a previous lesson. Now where is the control? The control is the bulk of this circuit. It makes up this entire top box as well as this mux down in the middle. What does the control do? It sends the various signals to direct the flow of data through the serial adder device. In order to do this, it needs to know what the current state is, idle, load, or add. That state memory is held by these two flip-flops. The control signals sent to the serial adder are determined by knowing what the current state is, as well as how many clock cycles we have been in that state which is kept track of by this counter. Our control in this example gets complicated because of one big thing missing, status signals from our data path. This serial adder only sends out the sum. It does not have a signal to indicate when it reaches the end of various phases. Because of that, the control must do extra work. In a later example, we'll see how much simpler a design can be when we have those status signals. The only part of our model not mentioned yet is the external signals. Here, that is simply the start switch. When we set the start switch, that tells the control circuit to begin its process. Side note, the state reset switch is only necessary to begin the circuit the first time, because flip-flops need a starting value. So if you build the circuit, flip this high once, and it will force the state memory to zero, zero, or idle mode, then flip the switch low and don't worry about it again. That's it for the overview of the various components of the circuit. Now let's get down to details, which are summarized nicely in this next state table. Let's begin with the state memory. We arbitrarily chose 0, 0 to represent idle, 0, 1 to represent load, and 1, 0 to represent add. We can see in the table how the control remains in its current state for a time, but then there is some signal needed to cause it to move to the next state. In the idle state, we remain in idle as long as the start signal is not activated. So we leave the flip-flops in no change mode by passing in zeros for the J and K inputs. Max1 and Max2 are almost always zeros. We'll see what those mean shortly. 
But once the start signal is activated, we move into the load state. This means the rightmost flip-flop needs to jump from 0 to 1. How do we accomplish this? By setting that flip-flop with j equals 1. That is why this start signal feeds in as the j input. But wait a second, should we always be able to activate the start signal? No, our next state table tells us that we are designing the start switch to only function while we are in the idle state. This is the purpose of the AND gate connected to the start switch. Only when Q1 and Q0 are both low, in other words, only when we are in the idle state, can this AND gate output high and thus send the activate start signal to the flip-flop. After this, we are in the load state. Based on our table, we remain in the load state until the count reaches 7. Remember it takes 8 clock cycles to count from 0 through 7. And we need 8 clock cycles to load in all 8 bits to the adder. This count is monitored by two devices, the counter and the decoder. When the counter reaches 7, line Q7 from the decoder is high for the first time. And this allows the MAX1 signal to become high. Interpret the name MAX1 as meaning that we have reached the maximum count in state 1 or the load state. And, just like we saw for the start switch, this can only occur if we are in that specific state. The AND gate ensures that MAX1 can only be activated if Q1 is low and Q0 is high. In other words, if we are in the load state. What effect does this MAX1 signal have? Look at the state memory. When MAX1 is high, it resets the right flip-flop and sets the left flip-flop. So, it sends the state memory to 1,0 which indicates the add state. That's good. We should begin adding after loading in the data. The same strategy is used for leaving the add state and returning to idle. The signal that accomplishes this is max2. From this decoder logic, we see that max2 is high only when the counter reaches 3 and the state memory is 1,0, indicating the add state. The MAX2 signal resets the left flip-flop, thus returning the control to the idle state. And there the cycle is complete. The circuit is ready to run through the whole process again once the start signal is activated. Let's watch what we just described in action. Keep your eyes on these monitoring displays. I'll choose two new numbers to add. Then I'll flip the start switch. On the next clock pulse, the state updates to 1, and the counter resets to 0. Then, for each of the next 7 clock cycles, the counter goes up by 1. Once the counter reaches 7, the MAX1 signal is activated, meaning that on the next clock cycle, the control will leave state 1, load, and move to state 2, add. And so it does. Now the counter resets to 0. When it climbs up to 3, the MAX2 signal is activated. Now on this next clock cycle, the circuit leaves state 2, add, and returns to state 0, idle. At the same time, the final sum is clocked in to the output register. We haven't talked about this yet. How did it happen? Based on our next state table, the output register should be loaded with the new data at only one time, when we leave the add state and return to idle. Ideally, there would be an enable port on this register, but there isn't one, so we must control the enabling via the clock port. Only when a positive edge, or a change from 0 to 1, occurs on this port will values be clocked in to the register. We need this to occur after MAX2 is activated. Once MAX2 drops from its active 1 to inactive 0, this NOT gate reverses that into a jump from 0 to 1, which then clocks in the final sum. We observe that the counter resets to 0 in two cases, 
when we leave the idle state or when we leave the load state. This is by design, as seen in the next state table. How do we accomplish this in the circuit? Through this reset count signal. When a low signal passes into this port, the counter loads in whatever is on the D ports, which here is all zeros. The reset count signal comes from this NOR gate here. Remember that NOR logic is just OR logic with an active low output. So when either the start signal is active, indicating that we're leaving the idle state, or the MAX1 signal is active, indicating that we're leaving the load state, then the reset count signal is activated and we start the count again at zero. That summarizes everything we see in the control region up top, but there is another little component that just didn't nicely fit in the box, this multiplexer down below. What is it doing? It allows us to feed in the input data serially from the register into the adder. The register is a temporary holding place for the two 4-bit numbers we want to add. Those 8 bits are clocked in once the start signal is activated and then are held constant for the remainder of the loading and adding process. The MUX then selects one bit at a time to pass into the serial adder. It does this with a neat little strategy. The counter values act as the data selects here. So when the counter is at 0, the MUX selects D0. When the counter is at 1, the MUX selects D1, and so on. In this fashion, all 8 bits are loaded in during the 8 clock cycles of the load state. That pretty much covers the operation of the serial adder with control circuitry. Is it a challenging design? Absolutely. There are several different components, and each one works in tandem with the others. To fit them all together, we must understand the behavior of the individual combinational circuits, like the multiplexer and the decoder, as well as the sequential circuits, like the flip-flops and the registers. Each of these devices has various differences, like active low versus high inputs, an enable port or lack thereof, and whether or not they are dependent on the clock. So we must know the pieces to get the whole puzzle together. But at the same time, we must have a vision for what that whole puzzle looks like. This is the point of the next state table and or the flowchart. Without going through those broader design steps, the puzzle pieces will remain jumbled in the bottom of the box. Some key design steps here were identifying the states based on knowing the operation of the serial adder, defining state codes, identifying what causes a change of state, identifying control signals during those changes, and summarizing them all in a table. Take some time to soak this all in. Build the circuit yourself. Study the next state table. Ask about the purpose of each device and each input to those devices. And when complete, reflect in wonder at the realization that you are pressing a couple of buttons to cause millions of electrons to flow in a pattern that you created to accomplish your purpose. That is cool.